<laughs> now, are you aware of any other podcast in a hot tub? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Here right. we go. We're the winners. We're the winners. I love it. All right. Um, let's do this. Boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in Boston, Massachusetts. We are now speaking again for our second show in the hot tub again <laughs> with Dr. Rick Doblin, the founder and executive director of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Thank you so much. For oh, Alan, it's, it's great to join you for this series of uh, hot tub interviews this one the pg version with bathing suits <laughs> yeah. we, we spent a lot of time editing the first hot tub version because we needed to make sure that there was no lower body visibilities because we came in naked this time we are in bathing suits to make editing much easier and the pg version as rick said and oh, rick oh my gosh okay, okay. the 33 years that Rick has put his life, blood, sweat, and tears into yeah. psychedelic studies. You can watch our first episode together, the links in the bio, where we talk about that 33-year journey and what has yeah. really went into understanding um, how psychedelics can inspire a sense of unity and help a lot with uh, some of the big issues that we see today. With 10 million people have PTSD in the United States, Rick's currently in phase three. Yeah. of clinical trials with MDMA, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Very important. Yeah. So, so important. And we'll have you break that down again for us for as a refresher. And they're in phase three right now. They, they uh, were awarded the breakthrough. Breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA. Yeah. Yep. For the most promising drugs. Yes, and that yeah. means you actually got to work with the FDA on road mapping out how this study is going to play out in phase three. Yeah, how we're going to spend the $27 million <laughs> over the next couple of years that we've raised all from donations for phase three research. And huge shout out to all of the humans that have helped contribute to oh, this. Oh, yeah, we just did a, a year-end fundraising. We had over 1,600 people donate. Yep. Oh, I was one of them. Yeah. Great, yeah, great. It was fantastic. Yes. And, and we promoted it, too, trying to get more people. It, to, it worked great. Yeah. We, we raised over $400,000, shockingly. Yep, yep. Yeah. Boom, just like that. Yeah. And now, so so it's aiming to figure out how to spend the $27 million on Phase 3 now. Yeah. And there's, so, um, so let's break this down. So, okay, everyone, um, there's, you had radical success in Phase 2 of clinical trials. Um, in phase two, you saw that 68% uh, of your 107 yeah. uh, patients experienced uh, no, no longer PTSD symptoms. Well, that was at the 12 month follow up. Okay. So the way the research is done, we compare everybody at baseline, then we get the treatment. Some people get MDMA with either, um, with psychotherapy, some people, well, let me say it again. Some people get therapy with either low-dose MDMA or no MDMA, and then some people get therapy with full-dose MDMA, and then we compare the two groups. And yep. so for the FDA, the measurement two months after the last experimental session, it's what's called the final outcome measure, and that's what the FDA is gonna look at yes. to approve the drug between uh, the control group and the experimental group. The 12-month follow-up is what we're doing more for insurance companies to try to help them see that it's durable, that they spend all this money on this short-term intervention, but it lasts. And so that's where the 68% figure comes from. The two-thirds, more than two-thirds, no longer have PTSD at the end of the 12 at months. 12 months. It's around 61% at the two-month follow-up. Yep. And, but what that shows is that people have learned how to process painful emotions. Yes. And that they continue to do that on their own after the treatment. So that people keep getting better after the treatment is over. It's not like a traditional treatment with, let's say, SSRIs for PTSD where it controls some symptoms, but you still generally have PTSD. And if you stop taking the medicine, your problems come back because it was just symptom relief. Yep. We're trying to get to the heart of the problem which is these fearful memories that torment people and help them process them in a different way. And so yes. that's the beautiful part, is that people keep getting better on their own after we're done with the treatment. 
Yes, and so th this is also so important, as Rick is bringing this up, this is not just the single um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy and then you're out the door. This is 12 total assisted sessions. No, three, no, three, no. Oh. Three, with the, oh, yeah. okay. three with MDMA and then about nine or so without. Well, well it's actually three MDMA sessions, day-long sessions. Eight uh, hours. Eight hours with yep. an overnight stay for people to rest and then... There's 12 90-minute non-drug psychotherapy sessions. Got it. So there's three before the first MDMA session for preparation and to develop what we call, or what the field calls, the therapeutic alliance. The trust between the therapist and the patient that they're going to be safe, that they're going to be yes. supported. Yes, yes. And we have two therapists, a male-female team. Yes. So it's not just one therapist, it's two. We're yes. evolving to the point where it will be one experienced therapist and then a student because it's very expensive to have two therapists for one person, but if we can make it so that it's just really paying for one and the other gets minimal payment because they're getting hours towards licensure and we're training the next generation of therapists. Yeah. So it's three MDMA sessions, three to five weeks apart, and then three non-drug psychotherapy sessions for preparation and then three for integration after each MDMA experimental session or, yep. or for the control group, the therapy takes place without MDMA. So in yes, phase three, yes. there's no low-dose MDMA. It's either therapy with inactive placebo or therapy with active MDMA. Yes, and again, it's this, the, the psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy component is so crucial that there is a male and female psychotherapist out there with yeah. the with the patient. Um, and if you want to take a look at some of the partial testimonials of oh, some yeah, of the phase yeah. two um, studies, there was um, a, a, a veteran that had um, severe um, suicidal tendencies yeah. and then went through your phase two and then had no suicidal yeah, yeah. In, um, inclinations whatsoever afterward yeah. so yeah. this is many, it happened with many and we have and he was a veteran that had previously attempted suicide several times yes so we don't exclude people that have never tried suicide so some people might say that's kind of dangerous to include people in our research but what we're trying to do is work with the most difficult cases yeah because MDMA is controversial and so if we can show that it works with the most difficult cases yeah. that will help get it approved yeah and then the, the other thing I want to mention is that um, people often go into um, sort of regressed states that a lot of people that have PTSD have had earlier experiences of trauma in addition to whatever it was that tipped them over into PTSD and we don't know people's history as well as you know they have it stored in their minds stored yes. in their bodies there's a book by Bessel van der Kolk a doctor who's an expert in PTSD who's the principal investigator of our Boston site yes. and his book is called The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. So what we have this view of our therapeutic process is that there's this inner wisdom I'm of glad the psyche. I'm glad you're going to the neuroscience and psychology ah. of things because we wanted to make sure to give a heavy touch on this. Oh good. Yeah. Okay yeah. So it's like the storage of the of the of the post-traumatic stress needs to be processed. Yeah, and what happens with PTSD is that PTSD changes people's brains. And the way it changes people's brains, it's like a, a groove, you know, in your mind, the patterns that develop. And so there's a reduction of activity in the prefrontal cortex where we think rationally and put things in context because people are emotionally, irrationally triggered. There's an increase in activity in the amygdala, which is where we process fear. And there's... Um, a decrease also in hippocampus where we process memories into long-term storage. So PTSD changes people's brains and MDMA changes people's brains also but in the opposite way. It's like almost like the perfect drug for PTSD. So in healthy volunteers taking MDMA into brain scans, fMRI scanners, it increases activity in the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, so people can think more rationally it decreases activity in the amygdala so that people aren't so reactive from fear from these powerful memories of trauma and it increases activity between the hippocampus and the amygdala so memories can be moved out of kind of the short-term storage where yes. it's always seeming like it's about to happen yes. or it's always still happening or every sound brings somebody back to the traumatic experience and so MDMA facilitates the recall of the memories 
And we have better memory recall under MDMA than people have without MDMA. So the memory of the trauma, people have a clearer memory for more of it. And the problem is that when you have memories that are unconscious or unaccessible, they, they control our moods, our immune system, control our behaviors, but we're not even aware of them. So the fact that memory is increased under the influence of MDMA is really, really helpful. And then the fact that this hippocampus amygdala connection is strengthened, that permits these memories that emerge into consciousness to be then stored in the past. They're not always happening. So that then what happens is the next time somebody brings back this memory, and it's called memory reconsolidation, mm. that memory is assembled from different parts of the brain, the episodic memory, the emotional memory, but when we have the experience, the memory, we have to recreate the memory, rewrite the memory. And so basically what we're trying to do is have a better recall for the trauma, but replace the fear emotion with an emotion of peacefulness and a recognition that it was in the past. Yeah. And so it's called the you know emotional memory and episodic memory. And yes. so we're yes. replacing the emotional memory with a different emotion because when they recalled the trauma, they weren't feeling the terror. Now, MDMA also increases hormones, particularly oxytocin and prolactin. Yeah. And these are the hormones of nursing mothers, the love, oxytocin has been called the love hormone. Mm -hmm. And so that creates a sense of safety, a sense of connection, because people with PTSD have lost trust or isolated, and the MDMA facilitates this uh, pro-social emotions and activities. And you may have heard, or your listeners uh, may have heard, or they're about to hear from, about it now, about the study in octopus, the octopi. So a neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins was interested in MDMA and pro-social behavior, and she wanted to do a study giving MDMA to octopi. Because humans and octopi diverged evolutionary about 250 million years ago. Yeah. And octopi have different kind of brains than human brains. And so the experiment was... Um, Octopus also has three hearts. There's some they're, crazy they're, things going on. Yeah, they're, There's they're, a lot of neurons in, the, in their yeah, tentacles, tentacles, and they're very yeah. smart. Yeah. They're, they're very smart. And so the experiment was a little bit like us in the hot tub. <laughs> so what, what they do is uh, the, they um, have a three chambers. In the first chamber is the octopus. In the, uh, in the center chamber is the octopus. On either side are two different chambers with doors into them. One of them is an inanimate object, a ball in a bird cage. Mm -hmm. So you can see through it, but the ball can't be moved mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. And then the other chamber is another octopi, mm -hmm. octopus, mm -hmm. in, also in this sort of um, bird cage, so they can't move either. So normally what happens is that the octopus will spend more time with the inanimate object than with the other octopus, whether it's a male mm -hmm. octopus and a female octopus. or huh. The only time octopuses are more social is during mating season. Mm -hmm. All right. So then, what they do is they've uh, they did a little. It took a little bit of uh, calculations and experimenting to figure it out. But they put MDMA in water, mm -hmm. and so uh, so imagine that we're an octopus, mm -hmm. and they dunked them in this bath for like ten minutes, and during which time the octopi absorbs MDMA. And I would like to explain: we have not dumped MDMA in this <laughs> hot tub water. That's right. Although that, that would have been a Other, waste of MDMA. Otherwise, we would have been naked by now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we would not care about yeah. PG. Um, all right. So, but, so then when they put this MDMA-dosed octopus in the chamber, it turns out that they spend more time with the other octopus than with the inanimate object. So there's something fundamentally physiologically going on with MDMA pre-language that's really deep about connections, yeah. about socialization. And yeah. so, you know, one thing that the FDA is requiring us to do, once we finish the study in adults, and assuming it goes well, we have been required to do phase four studies. So phase four is post-approval, and we're being required to do study in adolescents. Yes. Initially with 12 to 17 year olds, and then if that works with seven to 11 year olds. Now these are kids that have been traumatized. Trauma, as I said, changes your brains. You know, some people have heard, oh, we got to protect kids developing brains. But yeah. when they've been traumatized, their brains are developing abnormally. And MDMA can potentially restore a more normal processing and help people overcome kids. So we will find that out. And the fact that it works in Octopi to be yeah. pro-social makes me think 
that this therapy will work in adolescents and even younger kids who are traumatized, even without a lot of verbal psychotherapy, but just creating a safe space. So yeah. that's physiologically a bit of a story on how MDMA actually works. The other thing for the more scientifically minded people that are listening, um, I wanted to explain about a methodology issue related to phase three. And that's how do you do a double blind study mm -hmm. with a drug like MDMA, which generally if you've um, been told that you're gonna receive a placebo or you're gonna receive an MDMA pill and you receive the placebo, very few people think, oh, this is really the MDMA. And if you've got the placebo, very few, and if you get the MDMA, very few people say, oh, nothing happened. So how do you do a double blind study, you know, with a drug like MDMA? And so a lot of my um, dissertation at Harvard, the Kennedy School of Government, was on this problem. How do you solve the double blind issue? And as it turned out, I thought I had solved the problem. Um, if you use an inactive placebo, you know, it, it won't work that often to fool people. If you use active placebos like amphetamines mm. or tranquilizers, people will think, oh, something's happening. But both amphetamines and tranquilizers will make our therapy less effective. You know, when you tranquilize somebody, they need yeah. to be emotionally available. And when you give amphetamines to people with PTSD, if you look at the drugs that people with PTSD take to avoid their problems, it's alcohol, it's um, opiates, yeah. you know, it, it's sometimes other drugs, but it's not, they don't do stimulants because that activates them and doesn't reduce the fear. So giving those kind of drugs, first off, the therapist would be able to tell the difference anyway, and the patients might be fooled initially, but it makes the therapy more complicated, less effective. And so the solution that I came up with was low doses of the test drug. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. one group gets therapy with low dose MDMA, the other group gets therapy with full dose MDMA, mm -hmm. and then there's more confusion. And I thought the challenge was gonna to be to find the dose of MDMA that was low enough to uh, make people think something was happening, but not high enough to be therapeutic. Okay. Because if it's therapeutic, then you're gonna have a difficult time finding a difference between the two groups. Mm -hmm. So we tested 25 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, um, 75 milligrams, 100 milligrams, 125 milligrams, and 150. Yeah. yeah. And what we discovered, um, to my surprise, was that where it turns therapeutic, the, we found at 75 milligrams. So the group that got 75 milligrams did very, very well. This was in our study of veterans, firefighters, and police officers. Yeah. Even a little better than the group that got 125. Interesting. But the group that had 125 had more higher depression scores. Okay. But definitely, 75 was effective. Mm -hmm. Remarkably so. And so the lower doses of MDMA, though, did produce more blinding. So I was right about that. But they, they acted more like an amphetamine and that they made people more anxious. They stimulated them, but they didn't reduce their fear. And so actually people found it uncomfortable. And while they still got better a little bit, they didn't get as much better as the group that just got therapy without any MDMA at all. So when we went to the FDA for our final meeting in what's called the Special Protocol Assessment Process, where we negotiate every aspect of the design and try to come to agreement with FDA, and if you do, then you get this agreement letter. And that means the FDA is legally bound to approve the drug if you get statistically significant evidence of efficacy and if no new safety problems arise. And since Big deal. tens yeah. of millions of people have taken MDMA, we know the safety profile very well. Yeah. Over a thousand people have taken it. I think over 1,300 people have taken it in clinical research already. Mostly by other people, mostly yeah. healthy volunteers. But, yeah, yeah. But still. So we, we, we got this um, moving towards this agreement and the biggest hang up at the final end was how do we do this double blind study? Yeah. So I opened the meeting and I said one of my favorite quotes is um, that and I thought it was from William James, but it really is from an early president of Harvard. William James started the psychology program mm -hmm. at Harvard. He's the founder of American Psychology. Mm -hmm. The psychology building at Harvard is named after William James. So I got it wrong, but the quote I got right. And so the quote was from a, about a century ago. A president of Harvard said, 
never forget there's always a Harvard man on the wrong side of every issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I said, okay. this one, it's me. I thought I solved the problem, but I didn't because I yeah. did not anticipate that these low doses would have an anti-therapeutic effect. Yeah. So I went to the FDA and I said, we'll do whatever you want. You know, you can choose blinding. Yeah. Uh, or, but that's going to make it easier for us to find a difference between yeah. therapy with full dose MDMA and therapy yes, yes, yes. with this low dose. So I s propose that they do therapy with inactive MDMA versus therapy with full dose MDMA. Okay. But I said we'd do whatever they want. Yeah. And so the FDA said, based on the, the known problems of a double blind, and also the double blind doesn't work as often as people think it does, even with SSRIs and other drugs. Mm -hmm. There's side effect profiles that people can tell the difference, that the therapists and researchers can tell the difference. So the double blind doesn't, it's not as uh, theoretically effective as it seems on its surface. So the, so the, um, the there's uh, Bob Temple, who's a, the sort of old wise man at the FDA. He's been at the FDA since 1972. He's head of their Office of Science Policy. Yeah. He came to the final meeting. Good. And he said um, he agreed with us. And so we've accepted that there are going to be challenges to the double blind, but that this is the best way to do the design. And what FDA said was, in situations like that, and, and in general research, there's two main ways to eliminate experimenter bias. Not only did Bob Temple say that's the way we should do the study, but then when we presented it to the European Medicines Agency, they agreed with that. So the European study will be designed in a similar way. And because of that, the European Medicines Agency will accept our U.S. data. Cool. So while it's 27 million to make MDMA into a medicine for FDA, it's only going to be 9 million to make it into a medicine throughout Europe. Great. Yes. S -s I, I never thought about it so deeply that the design of the double-blind controlled study yeah. is what's so important to yeah. make sure that the effects yeah. are yeah. actually working out. Yeah. Now, what they said, though, is that the other ways that we eliminate experimenter bias are, first off, random assignment. So there have been some studies where you take uh, people who have a problem and then it didn't work for them, and then you say, who wants to volunteer for this new treatment? Yeah. And then you compare them against the success rates of the, um, the normal treatment. But that's not right, because you're getting people that are especially motivated. So they're more interested in getting better than those that didn't volunteer for this new experimental yes, treatment, yes. or they have less fears of the treatment. So you need random assignment. It means everybody is volunteering to be in the same exact design either to get MDMA or, psilocy or, or placebo, and then you randomly assign them. So that's a very important part of eliminating bias, is everybody's similarly motivated. Yeah. And then the other part is how you do the measures of the outcomes. And you can't have the therapist measure it, because they're biased, they want it to work. And so what you end up doing is you have a team of independent raters and we've got our team mostly has been trained by the Boston Veterans Administration, and they developed the measure called the CAPS, the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, and which is still used at across all over the, the world, world. Yeah. across the world, and it's yeah. been revised. So we're using the CAPS five, which is the latest version of it, and so we have this rotating group of around twenty raters that will be assigned to whichever person needs to be evaluated next, and it'll all be done by telemedicine. And so we're trying to break the connection between the raters, either being the therapist, but also knowing where the person is in the process of therapy. Is it the baseline? Is it after the first MDMA, after the second, after the third? Is mm -hmm. it the one-year follow-up, the two-month follow-up? So that's how we're going to do it. So we've had to come up with a very sophisticated way of doing the ratings. And that's the approach to eliminating um, investigator yeah. bias. Now the other thing I want to share is yes. that the double blind does sometimes work. And so we have a protocol from the FDA approved by the DEA where we can give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. And so we're training them for working on phase three studies where people will either get MDMA or a placebo. And so it's basically a five-day program where they come in on the first day, they get oriented, then the next day they either get MDMA or they get a placebo for an eight-hour therapy session. Yeah. Then the day after that is for integration and rest. And then there's a switch called a crossover, 
and then they get whatever they didn't get the first time, and then there's another day of integration. And yeah. so this, so we're preparing them to deal with how do you work with somebody for eight hours when they didn't get the MDMA, Yeah. and that gives people the experience of MDMA. Because as wow. we move to mainstream, we're going to work with a lot of people that didn't come from the psychedelic underground, that are from traditional therapy worlds. Yeah. We need a legal way to give them MDMA to prepare them to be more effective therapists. Yeah. So we've had two times of, so far we've done this for about uh, over 60 people from all over the world. We've yeah. trained in this way. Yeah. But we've had two times where people were so enthusiastic. These were both people that had never done MDMA. And now they had so wanted to get MDMA the first time because then also you have more days to talk with the therapist about what happened, more days to integrate sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, it turned out that they, um, both of these people um, were so relieved because on the first time they got MDMA and they went through this really profound experience working on levels of trauma, going back to childhood with emotional release, with crying, yes. just was fantastic. Now both of these were psychiatrists and they had watched a week long, part of our training program is a week long program, residential program, watching videotapes of actual therapy sessions, yes. going over our treatment manual and yes. talking about our therapeutic approach. So they'd already seen that. They'd already seen a lot of people doing MDMA through these videos. So they were super thrilled to get MDMA the first time. They had these profound experiences and they persuaded the therapist. Now these are experienced therapists that have worked with a lot of PTSD patients, 100% sure that it was really MDMA. And they were 100% sure it was really MDMA. And then they have their integration, they do more work, and then they were preparing for the third day to be an easy day, getting the placebo, just listening to music, and having kind of relaxed time. And so one of them, after about an hour and 15 minutes or so, during this easy session, he just stopped talking. And he yeah. didn't talk for hours. Yeah. And he was stunned because it turned out that he had gotten the placebo the first time. Wow. And that now that he had the MDMA, he was just speechless. And at one point, he turned to the books on the bookshelf, and he pointed at the books, and then he went like, no, and then he pointed to his heart, like it's all in the feelings. The books, the knowledge, the intellectual yeah. knowledge didn't prepare me at all. It's not in the books, it's in the heart. The heart, yeah. And, and wow. both of those people that were 100% sure, that persuaded experienced therapists that were 100% sure they had the MDMA when they really had the placebo, both were psychiatrists. So it's not to say that the, the placebo methodology doesn't work at all. And it, it's just astonishing. And That's what both of these psychiatrists said afterwards yeah. is that once they could recover their ability to talk, that there was an effortless and deeper flow between the conscious and the unconscious Beautiful. with the MDMA. That they realized how a part of their mind was leading them to have these experiences and trying to manufacture this MDMA-like state. So what that points out, first off, is that you can learn this MDMA state. That's why this is fundamentally different than traditional pharmacotherapy, where you get a drug every day for months or years or a lifetime. We only give MDMA to people three times, and the integration process is about helping them learn how to act like they're on MDMA, how to process emotions even without the MDMA. Yeah. So the difference between recreational use and therapeutic use is recreational use, people are like, I'm gonna take this drug, I'm gonna go out and party and have a good time. And then when it's over, it's over. But therapy, it's like, I'm gonna take this drug, I'm gonna go into this therapeutic situation, I'm gonna process the full range of emotions, not yes. just happy emotions. Yes, correct. And I'm gonna to try to learn and bring back and integrate so I can do this on my own without the drug. Exactly. So even though people think, oh, MDMA is a drug, it's a party drug, it's a schedule one drug, we actually have an anti-drug therapeutic approach exactly. to help people prompt them with some deep, profound MDMA experiences so they don't need the drug anymore. Exactly, yeah. Now that's also the orientation from a non-profit pharmaceutical that's company. That's right. Exactly. If we were for-profit, we were like, oh my God, you're gonna have to take this drug once a month for the Forever. rest of your yeah. life, or yeah. at least for a year or two, or, yeah. you know, so it's really remarkable. And yeah. I think it also points to the fact that MDMA, because it's not that fundamentally different from the way we normally process feelings and emotions, in a way, we can recognize it, but it's, it is fundamentally different in the sense of a reduction of fear, a, a new way. It's profoundly different, yet profoundly similar. 
So it's easier for people to integrate MDMA experiences than ayahuasca or psilocybin or LSD or other classic psychedelics, where there's ego yeah. dissolution, where it's a new, yeah. a different kind of consciousness. MDMA is more rational uh, consciousness with a profound emotional effect. And so yeah. that, that's, I think, what contributes to its therapeutic efficacy. Yeah, R Rick is pointing out a couple really key things here. First thing that he's pointing out that I think is so key is that the difficulty of figuring out how to design these trials properly, yeah. Yeah. and then also, because this is now going to be happening for all of the other uh, this is now going on with LSD in Switzerland. This is yeah. aiming to be done with Ibogaine and Ayahuasca and Cannabis and so many other Psilocybin, psilocybin yeah. as well. So so n now what Rick is doing is he's helping lay a foundation of clinical trial design yeah. Yeah. for the next psychedelics to come in and be able to tweak and play with this in ways that make sense. Yeah. And that's first this major crucial point that you're pointing out, which I'm so happy you brought up. The second crucial thing that I'm that I'm hearing you bring up that's so important to, to recognize is that there's this wide spectrum of of traumatic experiences that happen. Yeah. Any anything from um, actual abuse and violence and rape and and and, and war, uh, all the way to maybe somewhat classified as a more less abusive potentially trauma um, um, and and maybe that is someone passing maybe that is someone um, yeah. that, that is um, that prolonged you know, grief prolonged grief on yeah. something yeah. Um, and so with with work or with uh, family or with whatever what have us in this conversation that 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 trauma to be um, neurophysiologically ex uh, in, uh, integrated into our being most effectively yeah. um, through a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy experience can uh, not only help with 10 million people that have PTSD in the US but people around the world that have had humans are just un we oh. have traumatic experiences in our lives and just to be able to properly integrate them and move forward is so crucial yeah well there's multi-generational trauma that permits these conflicts to go on generation after generation and we're learning more about epigenetics how yeah. certain anxiety levels things can be passed from generation to generation not so much through changing genes but through changing which genes are turned on and off yeah. but the other thing I'd like to say is that for every human being who's alive right now there's an enormous background level of trauma because of climate change and global warming and the oceans warming and the extinctions of animals and the number of uh, nuclear weapons and biological weapons and if you read Correct. the paper you know the increasing polarization in the United States. And the, this came right after the Cold War. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, there's that transgenerational trauma as you were speaking. Yeah, it goes on yeah. and on and on. And so, so until we find that sense of unity with each other and with our planet and with our own selves inside, yeah. we, are, we won't be able to transcend the transgenerational trauma that is occurring. Yeah, so I think this points to another issue, which is the whole example of uh, and the historical experience we've had with global prohibition that we're talking about from a strategic point of view, working with the worst cases, the hardest cases, the people that are suffering the most, that are disabled with PTSD. There's roughly a million veterans receiving disability payments from the Veterans Administration for disabling PTSD at a cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 billion a year to the VA. Yeah. For all, and, and we've not got a penny from the VA for doing this research. Yeah. There's another um, 600,000 or so veterans disabled from anxiety, depression, and other mental disorders yeah. for another 10 plus billion dollars a year. So it's an enormous problem for the VA. It's an yes. enormous problem for society. Yes. And I think what we see is that politicians, particularly populist authoritarian politicians, manipulate people's fears and anxieties against the other. And they do that because people are un insecure and worried, and here's a convenient scapegoat. And so I think this idea of initially, for strategic reasons, working through science, working through medicine, trying to help patient populations that are highly valued by the mainstream society, like veterans and yeah. first responders yes. and yes. women who've been sexually abused, yes. that we are able to bring a controversial drug forward at a time of need but that overall, the long-term vision is that we move 
from a criminal justice approach to a public health, health approach, approach to treating people's interactions with drugs. And I'd say the fundamental problem yeah. of the criminal justice approach is that it, it invests drugs with certain properties. These are the Schedule One drugs. These are the bad drugs. These are the drugs you should never take. These are the drugs that always have risks and no benefits. And these are okay, the drugs you can take from Big Pharma or... Yeah, you know, tobacco, yet, alcohol, yeah, pharma. And of course they have side effects, but we'll overlook them. So yeah. we invest properties in drugs. And then, of course, the drug war has been used to demonize minorities, to... Uh, you know, here we hear about all these hordes of drug dealers coming through the Mexican border uh, when, you yeah. know, walls the, won't help. This was your initial, actually, study into um, psychedelics, was discovering oh. that it was a ban on psychedelics due to the sense of unity yeah. in the 60s that this inspired. Yeah, I think there is... Um, uh, two different narratives for the 60s. Yeah, yeah. One was that all these people took psychedelics and a lot of them were unprepared and people had frightening experiences and they went to emergency rooms or they had a schizophrenic break or they committed suicide or jumped out of a window or you know, stared at the sun and went blind. Of course, that was a completely made-up story. Um, but this idea that it was because of the excesses, it was because of the problems with the use of psychedelics that they were all criminalized. Yeah. The other narrative that I That's think right. is more accurate okay. is that it's not about when psychedelics went wrong. It's about psychedelics going right. Exactly. And, and this was part of Good Friday and your investigation yeah. into that and, figure, and and following up with people 20 years. 25 years. 25 yeah. years yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. And seeing the profound shifts still yeah. in people. Yeah. And, and so the Good Friday experiment was 1962 done by Timothy Leary was the faculty sponsor. Walter Pankey was the... Uh, investigator. He was a minister and a doctor, and basically and we went into this in detail yeah, already yeah. in the first one. Okay. But but um, but the continuation of this of the school of thought of the psychedelics going right yeah. and then being throttled. Well, well, but okay. So going right means people sensing that we're all connected. That we're all connected. Okay. Now this also happened during the '60s when we were going to the moon. Yeah. And so we started seeing pictures of the earth from the moon and you yeah. don't see borders you see yeah. this one globe we're all together yes so this fundamental sense of unity reduces people's fear of the other yes connects yes. us to the other and we appreciate differences because we're fundamentally the same yes we're different in in very minor ways yes and we can and i think if we look at religions like languages like there's all these different languages that different cultures have developed to communicate to each other. But it's a difficult thing, and, and they're different. The different languages emphasize different things. You think in different ways. But it's hard to say English is better than German, and German is better than French, and French is better than Spanish. You know, or French is the only way to communicate, really. All these other languages are invalid. So I think religions are like that. They emerge from cultures. They have certain cultural references. But they're all about this sense of connection, of spirituality. They all evolve at the here heart. on Earth. Yeah. They all evolve. So yeah. I think that we will appreciate other people's religions as different flavors, yes. different cultural histories. Yes. And so what we're talking about with this kind of global spirituality is not the loss of individuality or people's totally. individual religion. Totally. It's just a surrendering of these truth claims that this is the one right religion. Yeah. And this is the only way to spirituality or heaven or hell or however you want to see well, it. Well, the or one nothing. the one right way is earth. Is everyone here on earth is all sisters yeah. and brothers moving forward and yeah. collectively and, and so yeah. I think if we look at some of the things that developed in the sixties, psychedelics were connected to the anti war movement in Vietnam. They were connected to people that were involved in the environmental movement, in the yep, civil rights yep, movement, in the yep. women's rights movement. And so it's psychedelics going right. It's psychedelics having this consciousness experience of unity and connection that then has um, implications for people, for how they see the world and how they act in the world. And that was causing people to challenge the status quo. And yep. that's what led to the backlash. You know, it used to be that it was like the Copernican Revolution, where the Earth was the center of the universe. Yep. That's like our ego. Our ego yeah. was the center of the universe. That's right. Okay, and then it was yeah. the switch to the sun. The Earth revolves around the sun. Yep. That we revolve around the big self, the collective unconscious, the yes. history of mankind, all of the developments, all the millions of people that developed the languages that we use. So I think it's that switch, the That's Copernican switch, yeah. 
from what's the center of the universe, from our ego yielding. This, but the ego doesn't go away. The earth doesn't go away because we revolve around the sun. Yeah. So I think we can address the fears of the fundamentalists and say we can enrich your spirituality. And you don't have to believe this is the only way and everybody else is infidels and we have to kill them. Those are power yeah. games, not spiritual yeah, games. Yeah. And so I think it's that crisis of psychedelics in the 60s being connected to people challenging the status quo. And yes, to finish yes. the one thought about Ehrlichman, yeah. he said in an interview later in the 70s before he died that the two main enemies of Nixon and the Nixon White House were civil rights and hippies. Yeah. Civil rights activists and hippies. Yeah. And he said... We, if we could criminalize the drugs that they used, opiates for a lot of the African Americans, and psychedelics and marijuana for the hippies, if we criminalize those drugs, we can disrupt their meetings, we can go after their leaders, we can stick them in jail. Yeah. And he said, did we know we were exaggerating the risks of these drugs? Of course we did. So I think that the narrative of what happened in the 60s, there were problems with psychedelics going wrong, but it was really psychedelics going right. So as we introduce psychedelics back into the culture now, People have already seen after 50 years that most of those people that did psychedelics when they were young did not go live on a commune and grow soybeans. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they yeah. became part of society, like Steve Jobs, founding Apple. Absolutely. And so I think that's the, the that didn't happen. And so now we really have to be careful about the other problems of psychedelics going wrong. Yeah. And that's why we have... It's not yeah. psychedelics. It's psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Yeah. You, so now we you, can move on to you did you did such a good job at at uh, making a comparison to the Copernican revolution. Yes. Our soon our ego as our self will take a backseat to the collective, but we will still be able to be individuals yeah. on this rock together. So ego the, death is a wrong term. Yeah, yeah, correct. The and ego doesn't die. Well, one, well, one can the the well, the death the inflated me inflated. And, well, well, one can oscillate between yeah, yeah, the yeah. between the lowest ego states and the highest, yeah, yeah, etc. Yeah. So, um, so as you, as you speak about this, it, it seems as though we will be uh, we're getting to that point finally where we are slowly transcending the older uh, infrastructures of, of, of civilization and moving forth into more potentially prosperous unity this, this structures. Is the stru this is the struggle, hopefully. This is the struggle And I think we can through, see yeah. the rise of Trump and the rise of populism as a reaction against that. And it's, it's it's very interesting to to think about how to properly uh, in uh, really dose up on love across the world <laughs> first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there, you can't just go okay, no borders, and then the the next day right, because right. there's still people that haven't quite dosed up on love enough. A lot of and, people like that. And so one needs to then properly ensure somehow through trust-based protocols that everyone on earth or a lot of people on earth are dosed up on that true love then make a deeper more uh unity infrastructure made available to people uh as a, as a transition and that's why we need to go beyond medicine beyond and end prohibition so that yes. billions that's of right people can have these kind of experiences Voluntarily, if they want to. Yes. And that's I think right. the more that they see the outcomes for people that have done this, the more people will be open to it. That's right. And Rick again is coming, bringing us to the public health approach to yes. these things. Yes, that's the and key. in and um, you're right that as we bring up the public health approach and bringing in involving psychedelics in the public health approach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we bring. We bring we bring psychedelics up in the public health approach in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and, and all drugs in general. And all drugs in general in uh, in uh, integrating our our traumas, our transgenerational traumas. Till this point, that makes it easier for us to get to the point of unity through a public health approach to assisted psychotherapy. I love that. Yeah, um, and, and, and yeah. I'll just say that, that Robert Mueller, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, in the 80s, who wrote a book, 83, called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. And that, his fundamental thesis is we need global spirituality. And his book was beautiful, but he didn't say anything about psychedelics. So I wrote him a letter and 
to my shock, he wrote me back and we started communicating because I said, you didn't say anything about psychedelics. Yeah. And I told him about Good Friday Experiment and, and then he came along and he started helping us bring back psychedelic research. But I think that's this theory that you might say, hey, it's a bunch of hippies in a hot tub, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's not. It comes it's from not. the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. That's right. That this kind of global spirituality is where we need to move. move. And that a lot yeah. of the conflicts yeah. between nations are religious conflicts. Yeah. And so yeah. we need this right. global spirituality. That's right. And how we develop that is the challenge of uh, the human species right now. It is, yeah. It is. So well said. This is the main challenge of the human species is prospering together moving forward. Yeah. Rick, I want to make sure we touch on this. Um, okay. We are moving toward a uh, an era of, of figuring out how to administer these most effectively into the world. And there's more and more uh, pop-ups sort of happening. For example, you taught us about this in the last session that that the University of Mississippi has a monopoly on the cannabis, yeah, yes. then that DEA said, okay, fine, that's done in 2016. Yeah. And so now it's opened opened up the doors to... No. Okay. No. So I'm so yeah. glad that you brought this up. So... But everything you said up to that last point that it's opened up stuff is right. So in August 12, 2016, um, DEA put something in the Federal Register saying we're going to end the monopoly yeah. uh, on DEA licensed marijuana because the FDA is a federal rate agency and it can only work with federally legal marijuana. So even though we have all these yeah. states that have marijuana that's of high quality and better even than the Correct. product that's grown at the University of Mississippi, we can't use it in FDA studies. And the marijuana that comes from NIDA, it's only for research, not for commercial sales. That's so right. So phase three must be with the same drug sure, that sure. you want to market. Yeah. So yeah. this monopoly started in 1968. I think we're going to be able to yeah. end it in the next six months. But what okay. happened is once the DEA put this announcement in the Federal Register, that was in August of 2016. Then in November, Trump got elected. Yeah. And Trump put in Attorney General Sessions. Yeah. And he is like a troglodyte back in the olden days dinosaur sure. and he said no to marijuana so there's sure. roughly 26 applications that he has blocked for now for now for now, now so there's we may a see, new we may see a attorney general yeah. there's multiple people in the got senate it. that are on our side and we're about to either launch a lawsuit um we, we've yeah. got an application Good. in from Lyle craker at umass amherst so i do hope yeah. in the next six months that marijuana will become federally there will be federally legal marijuana processors, private producers that could make it into a medicine. And our goal and we, is to make the butt, the flower, exactly. in cheap form. In, it will become generic after three years after we make it into a medicine. Yeah. And so I'm totally in favor of all sorts of pharmaceutical companies taking the marijuana plant, slicing and dicing, making extracts, making non-smoking delivery systems and drops and sprays and topicals and edibles, all this kind of stuff. But I want the plant, the flower, to be a medicine also and it will be the least expensive medicine as a check on all the prices that all these other for-profit people will charge. This is so important that we're, we're making sure to, to highlight this, is that the United States is actually giving up a 30 plus billion dollar exactly. medicinal marijuana market across the world to Canada, Israel, United Kingdom, yeah. etc., and Netherlands. And what we see is, you were told us about this last time, that Israel is now down to $14 an ounce, like 60 cents a gram yeah, yeah, of yes, really yes. high quality cannabis. Trim buds. And trim buds. And the way that we can then take this extremely low price, if we can do this right in the United States, if we can really quickly move the ball forward with cannabis, we can then start testing it for PTSD with veterans. We can really start moving yes. the ball forward in that yeah, regard. Yeah, although I would say that we, we are just now finishing our first study with PTSD, with cannabis for PTSD and veterans. We got $2.1 million from the state of Colorado from marijuana taxes. And that was the first government money, which is, thank yeah, goodness, yeah. Yeah. from and the it was, state government. It, it used yeah. marijuana from Mississippi, from yeah. NIDA. And did Michigan get the yes, what you it, taught us about? Yeah, yeah. so, so um, l let me just say that, yeah. that, that the, the project that we've just finished is 76 treatment-resistant, chronic, severe PTSD patients, all veterans. And we've just, um, the data lock will be uh, February 8th, coming right up. And then we will analyze the data at the end of February and then decide do we need to do more phase two studies, more phase three studies. But we have finished and the results 
we can't say, but one was a group that got CBD, one got THC, one got marijuana with THC and CBD in it, and one was a placebo. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're very excited about moving forward with the marijuana project totally. as well. So what happened in Michigan is Rob Campia, who is was who was the founder and the executive director of the Marijuana Policy Project, they've had a big role in a lot of the different uh, state legalization efforts, Colorado and others. And they, they baked worked, it into their yes, legislature. Yeah, yeah, so they put yeah. in the Michigan a little tiny sentence or two yeah. that says that if Michigan legalization passes, there has to be $20 million a year for two years for veterans, for veterans yeah. and to deal with veteran suicide. That's and so it has great. to go to nonprofits yeah. or academic researchers, not for profit companies. And it passed. It passed. Boom. So we got to do more okay. things like now, that. Now, then there's been various people inside Michigan have been saying, talking bad about MAPS. Like, uh, they don't want MAPS to get them. MAPS is going to take all the money away from Michigan and take it out of state. Or we're going to transfer the money to psychedelic research. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a document for Michigan state legislatures, yeah. uh, legislators, because there yeah. was an effort in the. Um, before the, the new legislature came in, in the lame duck session, to change the initiative. And they were trying to change this $20 million yeah. a year for two years, but they were unsuccessful in yeah. doing so. And what we've indicated is that we're willing to do whatever amount of research they want to do in Michigan, but it's not the smartest, because the initiative was because 20 veterans a day are committing suicide. Yeah. And marijuana yeah. can be helpful. So totally. if we just try to do the study inside Michigan, it'll take longer to recruit all the subjects. So we're going to try to have many sites in Michigan, but sites all over America. Now, again, the legislature has to come up with the procedures. They're not going to have money for a year or so until they actually start selling marijuana, collecting the taxes. But yeah. that's a very hopeful sign it in is. the future. Yeah. So the other way to break the monopoly is through importation. But so far there's no... Um, the Israelis wanted to export... And President Trump called President Netanyahu and said, block it, which he did. That was about six months ago. So now the Israelis, have, the parliament has passed again another bill approving export. The, um, none of the Canadian companies have yet been willing to export flowers. So right now we have no ability to import from around the world, but that's another way to break the monopoly. And if we do, then it's utterly senseless to have a, prohibitions against domestic production. Yeah. If we can go into drug development research with imported supplies, all we're doing is hurting Americans by keeping this exactly. prohibition in place. Exactly, and we see uh, countries like Canada making cannabis on their on their public stock exchanges. Oh my God, these companies are available. worth billions. Billions of dollars already. The United States needs to play catch up. We've talked about that with Steve D'Angelo and yes, a couple yeah. other global leaders on our show yeah. um, in the space. So we're really looking forward to that. Now, um, cannabis is one of many other subject yeah, yeah, areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a couple other um, psych psychedelic assisted psychotherapies going on. There's LSD, there's Ibogaine, there's ayahuasca, um, there's several psilocybin, and this is all for um, the compassionate use to deal with anxiety. Mm, not so much. So the psilocybin is for okay. pain addiction, for alcohol. So we there's an MDMA study in England for MDMA for alcoholics on the theory that trauma is what drives people to run away from their problems into drug abuse. So there is a lot of work in the treatment of addiction okay. with uh, with psilocybin for tobacco addiction, for alcoholism, for cocaine. That's crucial. So addiction and then there's the end of life as well and dealing yeah. with that um, really well. Yeah. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's been some. We're starting a new study with Very eating disorders, MDMA for eating disorders. For eating disorders, we, for obsessive compulsive. Yeah. Wow. So we're bridging couples way past therapy. PTSD. Even, even couples therapy, although we've done that in the form of PTSD research, there's a technique called cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy conjoint meaning couple or dyads where one member has ptsd but it affects the relationship and so we're working with the people uh, candace monson and ann wagner they're now at ryerson university in toronto and we've been able to get permission to give both members of the couple mdma and it's been tremendous and so yeah. we have some measures of the relationship strength but the primary outcome measure was the ptsd of the person with ptsd in the dyad or the couple but Couples therapy would be an incredible use for MDMA. Absolutely, yeah, getting through things as couples. I can't believe that it's not, we're way past PTSD into yes, end of yes. life, into cancer, into OCD, into, um, into addiction. Social anxiety. We did social MDMA anxieties. for social anxiety in autistic adults. We did MDMA for people with life threatening illnesses, uh, anxious about dying. Yeah. 
So that's amazing that it's branching off into all different types of, of aspects yeah. of life. And that's so important to start testing that because there's so much better we can do. Now there's, um, and I'm, I'm really glad that you're laying the foundations for everyone else yeah. to be able to yeah. do it better yeah. um, uh, along the way. It's so funny that you also said that you, you know, you want to, you want to have this launch off as as a, as as your baby over the last 35 almost 35 years launch off and then you want to go to do psychedelic system psychotherapy for others yeah. and give that gift while other people take this torch and well that was it. actually my um, vision for my life at age 18 in 1972 is when I decided that I was going to be an underground psychedelic therapist and try to bring back psychedelic therapy I didn't really want to be an underground psychedelic therapist. I want to be legal. I want to do it. I want to just have a little office with a sign and not worry about the police. And boom, it now, made you an entrepreneur to move this all yes, forward. And yeah. now you find yourself and here. And <laughs> recently, we, I gave a talk with one of the veterans, with one of our researchers, and we have a senior retired DEA official who's working with us as a consultant. Awesome. Whose son went into the military and got PTSD. Yes, and, yes. Um, opened his father's eyes to marijuana and exactly. other treatments for yeah. PTSD. So we just gave a talk at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Of Chiefs of Police. It's okay. like 10,000 people. This yeah. was in Orlando. And it's such a um, non-traditional audience yeah. that President Trump decided he would speak to that audience, too. Wow. So he came at the last minute, wow. and he spoke at the exact same time that, that we had our panel, which was a bummer for us because... A lot of the people went to him, but some people still came to, to us. Yeah. And one of the persons that came to us was a psychologist working with police officers with psychological problems, including PTSD. That's huge. And he worked it out with his chief, and he is now going to come to our training program in March Crazy. in Asheville to become a police psychologist able to give MDMA to police officers. Wow. And then that will also go into firefighting, into veterans. Yes. Wow. Yeah. 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 That's and so we're awesome. Training to, veterans, uh, to, therapists that work with the VA. And, yes. And we've had several firefighters, including one that had PTSD from 9-11. Yes. We had yes. somebody that volunteered for our study for phase three who has PTSD from Columbine, from the mass shooting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of potential yeah. benefits coming from it's this. It's cool how people are latching on and wanting to help work with you as psychedelic assistant psychotherapist across we, their industry. We have over 5,000 people on a waiting list who want to know about when we start our training program for training more 5, therapists. 5,000 5, people therapists. are on the waiting list. We have list. over 20,000 people who want to know about being in the study. 20,000 want to be, 5,000 want to be therapists in them. Yeah, that's and we haven't so even cool. tried it to magnify these numbers in see, either way. See, that's what's happening is that there's yeah. a lot of attention coming to this field. Okay, yeah. now getting to this. Yeah, um, to all this, these other things. So, yeah, this, well, this, this subject area specifically is getting a lot of uh, attention around the world right now. <clears throat> it's the idea that it's really important to do things like invest the appropriate resources into um, into competition and cooperation in yes. this space. Yeah. So, yes. so what is our ideal sort of, of of combination of those two forces as companies try and privatize their specific psilocybin yeah. blends? Yeah. Meanwhile, um, yeah. It, as yeah. we cooperate, we don't want to patent what the Earth produced for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So heal. I think that um, if we look at the history of maps, the things that I've gotten the most criticism for, the first was accepting a million dollar donation over four years from Rebecca Mercer and the Mercer family. They were the ones that supported Steve Bannon and mm -hmm. President Trump, and they support they owned Cambridge Analytica, which stole all the Facebook data, yeah. and also uh, Breitbart. Uh, but that was a and they, their, Rebecca's donation was limited to veterans in our study. Yeah. So that was important bipartisan bridging, but we got a lot of criticism of that. I and like the way you look at that is the bipartisan bridging. We're yeah. trying to bring humans together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. And that's the essence of democracy is you don't have to agree on everything. You find your areas of agreement, you work together and you yeah. disagree on other things. The other thing that I got a lot of criticism for was providing help or all of our information, all of our negotiations with the FDA to USONA, which is a non-profit group trying to make psilocybin into a medicine for depression, yeah. but also to Compass, which is a for-profit group. Yeah. So my view is, as a non-profit, people get tax deductions to give us money. We have an obligation to the public, and the public includes both for-profit and non-profit. And so I think there's a need for for-profit drug development in the psychedelic space, because that will permit scaling. I mean, 
right now we are That's frustratingly right. stalled out. We have raised twenty-seven million for phase three. Over the history of maps, we've raised over sixty million dollars in donations. Yeah. But we've been struggling now to raise the nine million we need to take phase three MD maybe DSD to Europe. Yeah. And then what about how do we set up thousands of psychedelic clinics or help therapists do that? So so there's a need for for profit, but for profit can be out of control. And when you profit maximize to the exclusion of everything else. So we started yeah. the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, yes. which is a modification of capitalism uh, yes. where you maximize public benefit. You do make a profit, but that's not your topmost goal. Your topmost goal is public benefit. benefit. And so we have the for-profit public benefit corporation, but it has only one investor, which is the non-profit. Profit, yep. All right, so what I'm saying to this is that um, we don't have any patents. We hired a patent attorney to develop an anti-patent strategy yeah. so that nobody could patent uses of MDMA, yeah. just so that they're all in the public domain. And so, But people will try to patent different things, and that will drive innovation and incentives, and, and, and I think that's okay. If they discover some new drug, let's say, that's better than MDMA, and somebody patented it, and they want to develop it in a for-profit way, I'm all for it. Yeah, the, the, you're right that we'll slowly move the ball f forward faster by allowing the private players to play, but preferably as benefit yes, corporations, yes. so yeah. that way they're maximizing benefit at, with the psychedelics that we've been given through Earth to help heal humans and, 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 I, I, and destroy these walls between us, rather than try and pr maximize their own profits. And, and put out the externalities onto other people, all the, the social costs other people pay and the company makes the profit. Yeah. I think that's not, and, and I think if you look at what's the main resistance people have to the legalization of marijuana, it's that big alcohol and big tobacco are going to get involved and then maximize profits, sell to kids, do all sorts of stuff. And that's actually happening. Yeah. I mean, the, the beer companies, the, the, the alcohol companies, the yeah. tobacco companies are buying into marijuana companies yep. for cannabis-infused beverages and exactly so yeah. i think we got to be very careful because yeah. that mind is being more that mind yeah. the mind's being molded into the world and if we're going to try and yeah. and and and, and de de deliver doses of cannabinoids at young ages yeah. Yeah. we have to be very careful with what the long-term effect of things like, yeah. like this are so we can't just go for profit we got to go for science research and development take it more totally. slowly let's move this okay. inside bye everybody from the hot tub we will rejoin we'll you rejoin you inside <laughs> what is our enclosed? <laughs> oh, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> the, there's the Chinese rover right there. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, we're back everyone from the hot tubs. Super relaxing, gonna have to make it a <laughs> series of updates on psychedelic studies in the, from Rick's hot tub. I think it's a tradition. It's a good tradition. <laughs> All the, none of the, where are the interviews in hot tubs happening around the world? It's good know. stuff. We and we did it in the winter this time. We did it in January yeah. this time. Last yeah. time it was in May. So this yeah. is much uh, colder. Well, this doesn't really count because there was no snow. There was we'll, no we'll snow. We'll have to do it while it's snowing. While it's snowing. I don't know how good the cameras will stand up to that. But to, the, uh... <laughs> to the snow. <laughs> we, we were ending our conversation in the hot tub on cooperation and competition. Yeah. And the how, how to best sort of add the privatization in to move things forward. Yeah. But make it like a benefit corporation yeah. like you were saying yeah. as yeah. well. Um, so yeah, so tell us again, because this 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 is kind of where people are seeing the future. Yeah. So where, how how else can we understand this in a way that people can maybe get involved with starting businesses as entrepreneurs? Mm, ah, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, there's going to be thousands of psychedelic clinics that need to be established. Um, we're thinking at Maps that we're going to have a network of clinics, but all the people that we train to do MDMA therapy for PTSD can set up their own clinics. So we're not trying to monopolize anything. And not only that, but they can innovate in a sense. So they, the way that we're negotiating with the FDA, uh, it's called the REMS, the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. So it's a special set of policies that are put into place 
to address special risks because every drug has, or, or many drugs have special risks. So with psychedelics, particularly with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, the treatment is not the drug. It's drug-assisted psychotherapy. So the only people that will be able to prescribe it and the only people that will be able to work with patients are those that have been through our training program to learn the psychotherapy. And it can only be administered under direct supervision, never as a take-home drug. So that's why yeah. we'll have psychedelic clinics, clinics. flourishing. And, but once people have learned our method, they're free to innovate or modify it if they want to, yeah. post-approval. But we think that with the MAPS clinics, it'll use our method, and that'll people yeah. know they'll, they'll get this, but other people could say, oh, I combine it with massage, or I combine it with yeah. some sort of guided imagery, or this or that. So we're, we want all sorts of different kinds oh, of so cool. therapeutic approaches to flourish. But I think that as we look at this, um, there's going to need to be all sorts of capital invested in creating these thousands of clinics. The therapists are, you know, working to make a living. People need so. Also, when we think about um, the future of work and the future of innovation and driverless cars and things, what are the things that cannot be done by machines? Yeah, a lot of it, like massage, or a lot of things like right. therapy. That's I mean, right. there are certain kind of um, machine intelligence programs to talk. You know, they pretend that, that, that are therapists in a way. But I think that these kind of helping professions, the, those are the kind of things that are going to be least likely to be automated out of existence, the human connection. Yeah. And so we're going to be creating jobs that are going to be uh, durable, even in the face of, um, you know, automation and innovation in that way. Yeah. So I think that there is a role for for-profit companies and people to make livings, helping other people work through dramas and work through relationship issues and work through uh, eventually, you know, personal growth. These clinics will be centers where people go for spiritual experiences. Yeah. Some of them will be run by your uh, local church or your local synagogue yeah. will have their own little psychedelic clinic. That's a, this is a really awesome future that you're painting for us. You're, you're preparing us yeah. in a bunch of different ways. So there's, there's um, you were mentioning earlier that there's there's 5,000 therapists that are ready, yeah. that want to get involved in, in, yeah. in, in your processes of becoming psychedelic assistant psychotherapists. And then there's 20,000 people waiting for the proper, for, for these, mm. for places like mm. these clinics to yeah. be able to go and get treatments. And then you're, you're even very intelligently showing us part of the future with automation is humans mm. that actually mm. can yeah. have the eye to eye, yeah. face to face, therapies yeah. and um, yeah. this yeah. is actually huge as you see these thousands of potentially um, clinics that are going to be showing up in the next decade let's say that to get involved in them is going through yeah. a process of getting trained by you and I yeah. love yeah. your formula you were talking about the formula here the formula is so cool because the formula is for now what you've designed and you found to be most effective yeah, yeah. for now and then there's going to be more and more dosage adjustments for different yeah, sorts of yeah, therapeutics yeah, yeah, yeah. that that are need to be done with different stresses on people's lives that they're trying to break free from um, and integrate etc um, <clears throat> and also adding in massage or lighting and oh, yeah flotation so. tanks but the the other further complexity is that we're talking about developing MDMA for PTSD. Others are about ibogaine for opiate addiction or psilocybin for depression or ketamine for depression. But what we're really talking about is psychedelic psychotherapy. Yeah. So in the future, people will get a series of different experiences with different psychedelic drugs. And there will even be opportunities to combine drugs. Like we've done therapy, um, you know, underground therapy. We have not done it, but underground therapists have done work where they combine LSD with MDMA. Or LSD with ketamine, even, or, or, or MDMA with ketamine, or the different kinds of combinations like this also offer, you know, new kind of therapeutic opportunities. And I yeah. think we'll see, more likely we'll see treatments where people go through a sequence of different psychedelic drugs, probably generally starting with MDMA, because it's the most gentle, it's the easiest to work with, it's the least distance from our normal processing. Yeah, but then they could go into psilocybin um, or LSD or ayahuasca or ibogaine or any number of things. And and the fact that we're doing a study with MDMA, um, you know, for PTSD, there's a lot of people that have dual diagnosis: PTSD and addiction. And so a lot of it is the trauma that drives people to addiction. But 
we, we will eventually have, uh, you know, the study in England that I mentioned, which is Dr. Ben Sessa, MDMA for alcoholism. Yeah. There's going to be all sorts, but then LSD has been really effective uh, for alcoholism. So you start with MDMA, work on the trauma, then you help somebody kind of have this mystical, spiritual sense of connection. And there's different kinds of strength people can draw from each of those kinds of experiences. Yeah. It's so cool that you put the, uh, as a, psychedelic psychotherapy is the umbrella. Yeah. And there's all different kinds of combinations that are yeah. going to evolve out of it. And then yeah. we'll yeah. see what's best for what. Yeah. 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 And the thing we haven't really talked about is our Zendo project. Let's do it. So the Zendo project is um, psychedelic harm reduction. So there's a lot of people that are, uh, you know, not waiting for medicalization, that are using psychedelics at events all over the world, at festivals, at music concerts, at parties. Um, and there's a lot of those people that are doing it um, for recreation, but then they, they really say, I just want to have the good experiences, not the bad, and then difficult stuff comes up, and they confuse that as being bad, and then they resist it, and then it gets worse. So as part of our effort both to to prepare the ground for a uh, post-prohibition world, yeah. but also to reduce the kind of potential for backlash that could come from you know, bad experiences with psychedelics, we have started the Zendo Project. Uh, our, our first effort actually was in 2001 at a festival where we tried to, and did succeed in working with the organizers, with the medical people, even with the police, and provided support for people having difficult psychedelic experiences. So that's what yeah. the Zendo project is. Yeah. It's, it's helping, so it's sort of peer support yeah. where we have a few trained therapists, but we train other people. At Burning Man, for example, we over the last two years, we've seen a thousand people who've come to us with difficult wow. trips. over two years. Over two yeah. years, a thou, over a thousand, thousand people. people. Yeah. And we've trained uh, over 500 uh, helpers. Oh, wow. Sitters. Exactly. Most of them therapists, but not all of no, them. Yeah. And so we're Whoa. helping to try to build into the culture, even of the recreational kind of, a therapeutic understanding, a spiritual mindset about how um, suppressing and resisting is really the more um, fruitless strategy that, yeah. that doesn't yeah. really solve the problem. It, it sort of prolongs the problem you, and, and to help people. And our big thing is... You know, difficult is not the same as bad. Yeah, the Zendo project is now is one of the sort of components that we should see at all different types of recreational yeah. use yeah. areas of psychedelics. Yeah, and that would yeah. be super helpful for these experiences. And 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 again, um, <clears throat> it's almost as though we're we're now you're laying again another piece of a foundation yeah. outside of yeah. your you know your B Corp and outside yeah. of yeah. Um, doing the trials. You're you're even in you know yeah. getting into yeah. the festivals and Burning Man and whatnot to yeah. help there. So there's all different <coughs> places that Maps touches yeah. with its kindness, with its heart, with its open and love. I, I'm. We, we are very honored to, to, uh, thank you know, you. to be sitting yeah. down with you and talking about this again. An important way I think we can wrap is by talking about how this all is intertwined. Ah, okay, yeah. Because we have so graciously been gifted with this consciousness on this planet that yeah, we evolved yeah. through time to get yeah. here. Here we are, all yeah. humans ever yeah. born in and lived and died on this rock together and we have to figure out the unity yeah and it comes from you were listing all these experiences the flotations the meditations the religious yeah. the spiritual the psychedelic yeah. there's all sex that. love sex romance love. romance yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> transcending our yeah. own time and space and, yeah. and and being a part of something greater so that sort of feeling is the most cohesive way forward. Yeah. I want you to tell us about your thoughts on that. <laughs> well, I think so many people come back with this idea that love is the essence of the universe. Yeah. Um, I, and I guess I'll share um, this story about uh, the most mystical experience of my life. And so it was at Esalen, camping out. Oh, oh we have this one from the, to... from the last one. Okay, I asked okay, you, I think okay. it yes, was, yes, what did right. I ask you? It was the most beautiful okay. thing in the world, yeah. I think. Well, yeah, it was, was the like deepest emotion you've yeah, ever felt. Yeah, that was gravity. It was the, the gravity, the, yeah. Yeah, the kind of um, 
being cradled in the arms of gravity. What? That gravity is this force that pulls us together, and there's a love yes. aspect to that. And that was so beautiful because that, yeah, yeah, yeah that was so good that yeah. you said that one. Um, okay, yeah. here, let me phrase the question okay. this way. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think okay. I have a good way to phrase it. Okay. What's a takeaway, a piece of advice for young people and adults oh. both that can inspire them towards that sense of unity? What can they better embody and practice oh. on maybe a day? Well, day? I think that for now in the American context, what we really need to do is um, heal these partisan divides and understand that, you know, underneath the, um, a lot of this anti-immigrant and white nationalism of a lot of the fears and anxieties that Trump is trying to stir up in his base, that there are people there who um, we need to reach out and we need to show them that there's a better way. That, and also that um, they're operating from a place of fear and anxiety that the culture, um, you know, hasn't properly addressed all their concerns. You know, the irony is that they get motivated through fear and anxiety to support um, policies that end up hurting themselves more than helping them. So I, I never quite could understand why, uh, you know, the affordable health care, you know, why people didn't like that. And it turns out that actually the, um, the most anti-government sentiment is in areas and states where people get the most government assistance. Hmm. Because there's this kind of sense of uh, not wanting to be dependent, but then getting angry. Whereas instead of seeing it as uh, necessary help, people you know, bite the end and feeds it. So I, I think that what we need to be doing is, is really listening at a deeper level to the pain that's motivating people to be separate yeah. and try to understand how we can work through it. And sometimes the, the, the problem is that um, people have to willingly let go of their prejudices and anxieties. You can't force them to do it. Yeah. And the same is true in a therapeutic setting. And that's why we say that basically people heal themselves. We create a support, the drug, primarily creates this support for people to process difficult emotions, but they have to be willing to do that. And so it's our job to create a context where people heal themselves. So we have to create a social context where people who are different from us um, are not so much judged, but are held in a certain way to, to acknowledge their own misgivings about some of the things that they might be saying or thinking. Yeah. So I think it's that way, and it's also, like one of the projects that we haven't talked about is that uh, I worked on it this morning, and I have to work on it later today, um, is a, a psychedelic peacemaking. Yeah. So we have yeah. a project, uh, Natalie Ginsberg, Lior Roseman, it's in Israel, and it's um, psychedelics for peacemaking between Israelis and Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And they've just come back from Israel a few days ago. And there's groups of Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, and Palestinians that are doing ayahuasca together. Wow. Kind of secretly, you know, or very secretly, but it's happening. And many of them have used MDMA. Yeah. Now, they're coming to these... That's great. It's incredible. Because they're, they're coming together. They're yeah. coming together primarily for healing. Yeah. And so we're trying to understand that, but we're also trying to... So, They've just completed, uh, Natalie and Lior, interviews with roughly 36 um, people, half Israelis, the other half more Israeli Arabs and Israeli uh, and Palestinians, the other half Israeli Jews. And what, they're, um, what we're wanting to do is, is create more intentional settings for peacemaking. Yes. So not just healing, but the healing interpersonal, healing inner trauma is important to then healing interpersonal. Yeah. kind of trauma. Yeah. And I think that that's the... And now, these are not the, the zealots on either side that would never talk to each other. That they, So these are the more progressive parts. But even then, they've grown up in cultures that demonize the other, that build fear for the other. So even the, the most progressive people have a lot of work to do to overcome their cultural training. And then we see it as like training the trainers. These will be people that will then go out and try to work with groups that are a little bit further on the margins towards hatred of each other. Yeah. And so I think that that's really the kind of direction that um, 
we need to be going in in general is, is looking at those uh, marginalized voices or those people that we discount ourselves and then uh, trying to understand how they got that way and what can we do. At the same time, you know, people have to be willing to change and when they won't, and this is why I'm not a pacifist, you know, and, and we were talking before, you have to defend yourself, you have to block them in certain ways from being racist, but at the same time have compassion because they are uh, narrowing their own frame of reference yeah. and they are suffering underneath that. So I think that's the challenge and that's why when I took uh, and started meeting Rebecca Mercer, I thought how wonderful that we can have this the uh, bridge. bridge. Yeah. And so when people would criticize me for that, I would say we're in the business of building bridges, not burning them. Yeah. Exactly. Why push people away like that? That's right. That's so right. I, I think the other part is this, and it gets in a way back to the Zendo project, is that people do have fears of psychedelics. I mean, these drugs do change consciousness. They do require letting go. You have to be safe to do that. Things come up that you weren't ready for sometimes. And there are a lot of legitimate fears and anxieties that people have about psychedelic drugs, about marijuana, and we have to acknowledge them while we move towards public health rather than criminal justice. Yes. I couldn't just started picturing how people over thousands of years have been fighting about religion and how yeah, that could yeah. in maybe a couple of generations just be done. I think it could be. Well, what they say is the future is always here, is the future is already here, it's just not evenly, evenly distributed. distributed yeah. So I think in many places there will be more of this recognition that we're all in it together. And I think if in a couple generations we haven't reached that point as a species, we may have destroyed the place. Yeah, we got to get there. Um, and that's also very interesting that this is now these peaceful gatherings are, are going on around the world in different groups that have been fighting over religion yeah. or land for so long. It, yeah. yeah. And, and there's also studies that we're not involved in, but that I think are really important. Our, there's a study at Johns Hopkins and NYU with uh, religious professionals from different religions giving them psilocybin in a therapeutic setting. And so they're kind of looking at the mystical, uh, looking at the experiences that um, people from different religions will have. And these are not just people, these are like ministers, pastors, people of the congregation, mm -hmm. imams, however. Mm -hmm. And and so they're, they're, they're looking at what kind of visions they have, what kind of experiences. And what they're finding is that it, it doesn't take people away from their religion. They just interpret their religion in a more um, symbolic rather than literalist way. Mm -hmm. And it revitalizes their appreciation for their own religion. So it's not going to be everybody giving up the past you know, to one you know, uniform global religion that everybody, you know, it's, it's going to revitalize all the separate religions. Yeah. So I think even when we, it's like the unity and um, diversity, the same way. Yeah, we we yeah. can appreciate other people. We're not the same as them. We're different. We can celebrate yeah. our differences and at the same time know that we're all together. Yes, yes. Now, last question is, what would you say is one of the core driving principles of your life? Hmm. Um, fear. Fear. Fear of what? Fear of doing nothing. Fear of the irrational dominating. So I think what I've been able to do is turn fear into an ally. Okay. All right. So what really motivated me at age 18 to work on psychedelics was fear. First off, I was educated about the Holocaust as a young boy, and that was terrifying that, you know, people could want to kill me and kill only for this religion of my family that I had nothing to do with. I'm born into that, and then a bunch of people would want to kill me. That was terrifying. You know, luckily I was born in America in 53 after that was over. So I was raised, you know, that was in the past. But it was the fear of that. And then not too long after I started really wrestling with that was the fear of the Russians and of um, the Cuban Missile Crisis and hiding under my desk at school and teaching you. And that was terrifying. Yes. And then became uh, the Vietnam War. Now all of a sudden it's my own country wanting to send me to war for reasons that did not make sense to me. So I, I felt that um, that people are, are, we're evolving, but we're still fundamentally more irrational than rational. Yeah. And that uh, that kind of irrationality coupled with the brilliant technology that we have, 
is destroying the world and could work in you know mass disruption, mass murder. So it was the fear of the irrational that and that the view that psychedelics brought the irrational to the surface, that brought the unconscious to the surface. Stan Groff, world's leading LSD researcher, said that LSD is to the study of the mind what the telescope is to astronomy and the microscope is to biology. Yeah. So I felt like here was a tool that could get us to these deep levels that are destroying yes, us. Yes, yes. And so I'd say it's fear that has driven me this whole way that made it so that I would never give up, but, but also propelled me in really healthy ways. So it wasn't debilitating fear yeah. uh, because I think I grew up in so, was so, I was so lucky because I grew up with all the advantages that you could have to think that you could make a difference. So I grew up in America at the time of the maximum strength of America in the whole world and American exceptionalism, which I believe that somehow, I don't believe it anymore, but that American people were essentially better than other people and that therefore that's why we were leading the world. But I, I grew up with that sense of confidence from America having won World War II and we're the most powerful country. Then I was a male. Not only that, I was the firstborn male child in my family. So I had that. Then I'm white at the time when white was really important. And I'm Jewish with the chosen people. Mm -hmm. And my family was financially well off with my dad as a doctor mm -hmm. and my um, grandfather having run a successful business. And so I had all the... the the, the kind of psychological advantages to make me think that maybe I could make a difference and all the support from my family. And that, I think, gave me the ability to not be overwhelmed by the fear. That, that the fear is the driving thing, but instead of it being overwhelming me, it was kept in a certain kind of balance. Yeah, and yeah. That, that's what I'd say. And, but, but the other big thing I'd say is that early on, because it seemed like um, in 1972 when I decided this, when I was 18, that, that and psychedelics had been squashed, and psychedelic research had been squashed, um, it, it was a massive undertaking to try to think about bringing it back. Yeah. And so what I realized at the time was that if I would only be happy if it worked, that I might never be happy. And I would always be waiting for something in the future to make me happy. So that I had to move from outcome to process. To process, yeah, to the journey. To the journey, to the struggle. And so if I struggled during the day and the world was still the same, I could still be happy. Yeah. I, I tried my best and that was satisfying. And I think that was the, the key thing that really helped me to not get burned out. You know, it was yeah. just this thought that it looks like there may be no success. I mean, when I uh, met my wife, uh, you know, one of the things that she said is that she really appreciated people who were um, working on lost causes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she, she thought at the time bringing back psychedelics sure. was a lost cause. So I love the Rick for doing <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, working on this cause. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. kind of like a noble lost cause kind of thing. Yeah. You know, she had done similar kind of you know, idealistic things. So I think that when you work on what could potentially be a lost cause, but you can get satisfaction from the daily struggle, sure. then that's yeah. the yeah. key to longevity. And also that you mentioned with fear, this is something that all of us experience, a lot of us experience, yeah. that we only have these 25,000 days alive and that we get to pick whatever we do every yeah. single moment is so important to, yeah. to striving to be our best in the world. And so to have some sort of a little fire under our butt that kicks yeah. us up and yeah. gets us going on that thing is, is yeah. so crucial. And the, the other advantage that I had is uh, access to psychedelics. <laughs> you know, we are now living in a time of the world that's never been in existence before. Oh, okay, Ibogaine from Gabon, from Western Africa. Oh, yeah, we can do Ibogaine. Ayahuasca from the Amazon. Oh, yeah, we can do Ayahuasca. LSD from the laboratory. Yeah, we can do that. MDMA from the laboratory. Mushrooms from the ground from thousands. We can do... So we wow. have access to these tools that have been fundamentally transformative in my own personal life. Yeah. And it's to those tools in the context of this therapeutic spiritual understanding that's also um, really enabled me. Because I know deep down they work. 
Yes. They, they help. Yes. They're valuable. Yes. They've got all sorts of um, challenges, but there's something to it. They've all sort of brought a sense of unity. The microscopes for biological, telescopes yeah. for astronomy, and then the psychedelics for our minds. So they've all sort of brought a sense of unity yeah. to, to us. Yeah, um, uh, and the other thing, just in terms of the fundraising, I mean, as I said, we've raised over $60 million. But if I had to tell a story to people to, of what we're trying to do, it would have been, you know, which is what I do, um, it would be very difficult unless people have had their own experiences as well so they can relate to the story. Yeah. So because psychedelics have been so widespread, there are, and, and many, many people have had these transformative experiences with them, yes. we can tell a story of what we're doing, but then it resonates with people all over. Because now we're doing the psychedelics because at dinner parties or on the yeah. internet and whatnot, and we're starting to share the stories, yeah. making it popular to be talking about how... Or if not even popular, safe. Safe. In a way. Safe. Yeah. And popular. And, yeah. and then yeah. we can and, uh, slowly destroy the walls. Yeah, and that's, that's why I'm yeah. so glad to be interviewed by you and to do this, because it's really yeah. another way of... So it used to be that I thought our main, or it used to be that our main obstacle, obstacles were regulatory, that we could not get permission at all. Then the main obstacles were money. How do we raise the money to do it? Um, and we've managed to do that in, in large part. And that, then the, the big challenge was, well, there's a bunch of these underground zealots, you know, but how do we train more therapists? So now we're figuring out how to do that. Yeah. And so now the last and final obstacle, I would say, or challenge is public education. Yeah. Is building support and that's where yeah. this is so crucial. Yeah. My gosh, these obstacles that you're just going <laughs> through one after the other yeah. and boom, yeah. now you're here thirty three years later. Yeah. Um we love maps. Maps dot org. Everyone go check out the link in Thank the bio. Yeah. Um also the the trials that are going through right now, keep an eye on them. Maps has on their on news. So many different videos are up oh, now yeah. and articles are written and with maps in, in the news and yeah. Also, just the trial design. Now we're going to be taking these combinations of both the trial design and rolling with them across other psychedelics, as well as getting these traumas that have been built up in society and helping us integrate them and move forward. Um, and the future looks like these clinics around. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's such interesting stuff to be able to talk to you for round two here at your home in Boston. Thank you so much for yeah. coming on the show, Rick. Well, I look forward to our next hot tub uh, interview discussion. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the great thing is, is that hopefully by then there will be more breakthroughs. And we, yeah. and with people like you and Maps, you know, you're at a you know a million bucks a month in spending now mm -hmm. on on making on pushing the ball mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. and that's so crucial. Let's get that to ten million a month. <laughs> I'm serious. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's get there. We can do it, and and uh, we yeah, will. Okay. We will. We will do it. The the, yeah, the yeah. millennials and Gen Z are coming in, and they yeah, have yeah. a strong yeah. drive for this potential yeah. into our world. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well they know it. the risks that are going on out there of not doing of this. not doing it. It's yeah. existential ones. Yeah. Yeah. Much love, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Go and check out the links below. Support Maps, please. Also, support us to continue doing cool things like coming to Boston and making these awesome interviews with different global leaders. Links are below. Also, give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you about the episode and your thoughts about all of this. You can also reach to it's Ask Maps at yeah. maps.org if yeah, you have yeah. any questions yeah, yeah. and also um, if you'd like to potentially get involved in any of the um, of the of the trials and processes of any sorts and bring this around the world. So please get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And much love, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in. Also, go and build your destiny, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Go and build. Go create. We love you so much, and we will see you soon. Great. Bye, Peace. everybody. Wow. That's sweet it. ending. That's it, my man. Wow. That's it. So much love for you. Mm -hmm. Good job. Wow. Good job. That was wonderful. <laughs>